We closed the last lecture remarking on the resiliency of economies hit by natural disasters. And our next task will be to look at the role institutions play in the recovery. As the title indicates, this lesson looks at markets and what they can do. The implication that there are things markets can't do is deliberate. And we'll look at the role of other institutions, governments, and nonprofits, for example, in later lessons. One of FTE's strongest messages is that the economic way of thinking is more than the ability to draw and interpret graphs. Graphing is conspicuously absent from many FTE curriculum materials as we adopted the strategy of the late economist Paul Hain, who encouraged his students to tell a plausible story. So you may be surprised to find that this lesson, to a greater extent than is common in FTE curriculum materials, incorporates the traditional tool of economic analysis, the supply and demand graph. Remember though that graphs are no more than tools, one way to tell a story. The economic reasoning modeled in supply and demand graphs does not depend on the graphs, nor do we consider the graphs necessary to teaching about the economics of disasters. However, graphs are commonly used in economic analysis and we recognize that many high school curricula require students to construct and interpret them. So FTEs made a conscious decision to use them in the economics of disasters lessons. As this lesson progresses, you'll see graphs illustrating disaster-induced supply shocks and consumption shocks, and you'll have an opportunity to practice using the model in the assignments for lesson two. But before we get into the graphing, let's review the conclusions reached in lesson one and then look at the role of prices and information in markets. In lesson one, we argued that to even ask the question of whether disasters are good for the economy is to ignore the first precept of economic reasoning, that scarcity exists. Using the production possibility frontier, we established that because disasters destroy resources, they must tighten the constraints of scarcity. Then, proceeding from the fact that scarcity isn't optional, the second precept of economics is that we must make choices about resources, both at the individual level and at the level of the economy as a whole. In our textbooks, those larger choices are usually presented as a trilogy of questions that face every economic system what, how, and for whom to produce. Economists call this process rationing, and like scarcity, in fact, because of scarcity, it's not optional. This means that the operative question is not whether to ration, but how best to do so. We have lots of options, and the best way to evaluate them is by how well they address the fundamental problem. We have to ask ourselves, which method of rationing best addresses scarcity? While we use other methods from time to time, for the most part, our economy rations goods and services through markets. That choice is vindicated by the relative wealth of market economies and the persistent poverty of peoples burdened with non-market institutions for rationing. And over time, we've learned what makes markets address scarcity so much more effectively than other methods? First and foremost, we know that market incentives encourage the least cost use of resources, and that they also direct resources to their most highly valued uses. And how do they do that? They transmit information to decision makers in the form of prices. A well-known illustration about the tin market, written by Austrian economist Friedrich von Hayek, is one of the clearest explanations of how prices transmit the information that decision makers need. Hayek asks us to imagine that tin has, for whatever reason, um, and he argues that we don't need to know the reason, but it's become more scarce. And then he explains how the market processes and transmits that information. Quote, all the users of tin need to know is what the higher price tells them, that they must economize tin. They have the information they need, tin is more expensive, and they respond as they perceive best serves their interests. The impact of those choices, Hayek continues, has far-reaching consequences. If only some of the tin users switch resources, quote, the effect will rapidly spread throughout the whole economic system and influence not only all the uses of tin, but also those of its substitutes and the substitutes of these substitutes, the supply of all things made of tin and their substitutes, and so on. 
Importantly, all of this reallocation of resources in response to changing conditions of scarcity takes place relatively rapidly and without orchestration. While economists have long recognized the critical role of information in markets, Hayek added a key insight, that decision makers in markets don't need perfect knowledge, just the information particular to their circumstances of time and place. And this is important to our study of disasters. Note what Hayek says, that the essential task of economic systems is the rapid adaptation to the changes in the particular circumstances of time and place. Now, I think disasters probably qualify as changes. But also note his second observation, that this information about the particular circumstances of time and place is localized and widely dispersed. Okay, so now we're back to markets, because as we saw in the tin example, what markets do is to rapidly and efficiently communicate that localized and widely dispersed information to the decision makers. The clear implication here is that market institutions are uniquely suited to respond to disasters. Now, think about that a little bit. The proposition that we can depend on impersonal, unorchestrated communication in natural disasters is a hard sell. If there's any time we'd like to feel that someone is in charge, disaster's it. But here's Hayek and other economists telling us that markets will respond effectively to disasters precisely because no one is in charge and because they don't need to have all the information. We have a tendency to think that things would work much better, that victims would be better served, that the recovery would proceed much more quickly if we had a decision maker with the all-important information. Okay, so let's look at that idea. What kinds of things would a decision maker in charge of disaster response need to know? Here's a little activity. You can download the instructions and the PowerPoint slides from the website, and you'll see that it can be easily updated for future disasters. When we run this activity live, we use a modification of a game show format and offer prizes for the student contestants. But here, we'll just run it online, and I'll pause after each question so that you can put in your two cents worth. And then we'll check the answers to see how you do as the disaster response czar. Okay, question number one. Relief work clearing debris to reach coastal communities in Banda Aceh after the 2004 Asian tsunami was delayed until what important capital equipment could be acquired? Okay, contestants, write down your answers. Need a hint? I'll give you a hint. Um, it's not mechanical. Ready? Here comes the answers. No, not bulldozers and front end loaders. Well, at least not the type you were probably thinking of. Elephants. Elephants and mahouts, their handlers, were shipped from Oliver Stone's film set for Alexander because modern technology was useless in clearing debris from villages in the less developed jungle regions. All right, glad you didn't bet any money on that answer, huh? True. That one's a little remote, and maybe you only want to be the disaster relief czar for the United States. Okay, so how about this one? Suppose that after a massive hurricane, the immediate survival needs have been, have been met. Water's distributed, there are no food shortages, um, there's tent shelters available. So nobody's in immediate danger. You're put in charge of getting supplies to stock stations where people can buy everyday things that they'll need while waiting to get back into their homes and neighborhoods. What three items would you have ordered to stock these stations? In other words, what three things could you be sure that people would want to buy? Okay, write them down. And actually, I'll let you pat yourself on the back if you can come up with two of the three most purchased items. Ready? Here we go. Toilet paper, disposable diapers, and strawberry Pop-Tarts. Now, I might believe that you got the toilet paper and that those of you with small children got the diapers, but how many of you got Pop-Tarts? Pop-Tarts, you scoff. How do we know that? Well, we know it because Walmart's database of consumer purchases told us what was sold after other emergencies. And not only was it Pop-Tarts, it was strawberry Pop-Tarts. 
So you might not have known, but Walmart knew. Hmm. We can come back to that later. Right now, you need to redeem yourself or get a new research staff if you're going to retain your position as the disaster relief czar. So here's question three. Pets. What about pets after disasters? Never thought about that, did you? I was in a major chain hotel during the 2007 California wildfires that forced massive evacuations, and I witnessed a management discussion about suspending the hotel's no pets policy as they looked at the line of people with dogs on leashes and cats in carriers wanting to rent rooms. After Katrina and Rita, pets rounded up in New Orleans and Houston were shipped to animal shelters in Denver. So it's a big problem. All right, now you're the disaster czar. If you'd been in charge of taking care of lost pets after Hurricane Rita, what non-food item would you have shipped to Houston? Non-food item. Well, of course, silly, disposable turkey roasting pans to put the pet food and water in. You were all over that one, weren't you? Uh, not so much. Well, since you didn't know, it's a good thing that the nonprofit Pet Rescue Volunteer Agencies knew. All right, last chance. You've got to get this one. What item is likely to be oversupplied after a disaster? Now, before you ask why you should care, think about this. As disasters are, you'll need to be prepared to deal with the oversupply and eventually to get rid of it. Come on, you have to know this one. Old clothes, heaps and truckloads and mountains of them. So many, in fact, that disaster relief urgencies call it the second disaster. I'm not sure anyone knows why the human urge to help others in disaster manifests itself in a desire to clean out our closets, but it does. And despite the best efforts of disaster response agencies to advertise that people not send old clothes, please, those agencies know and prepare for diverting or disposing of old clothes. But we'll come back to the nonprofits and their relief efforts later in lesson four. For now, Let's just say that it might not be good for you to quit your day job while you're waiting for the call to become disaster relief czar, because clearly you don't have it, the knowledge and information that is. But the point is that no one does. The title of this little activity is Nobody Knows Everything, and that brings us back to Hayek. True, nobody knows everything, but we don't have to be discouraged about that because everyone knows something. Walmart knows about Pop-Tarts and animal rescue nonprofits know about water dishes for dogs. And what Hayek teaches us is that that's all we need because markets take all those overlapping somethings and turn them into messages that sellers and buyers understand and could act upon. Okay, enough fun and games. Our next step is to get a little more technical. How do disasters change the conditions of scarcity and how do markets respond to those changes? The first case we want to look at is when disasters cause supply shocks. That is, they interrupt, damage, or destroy the provision of goods and services, especially things like gasoline, electricity, housing, and water that people rely on to pursue their everyday lives. A supply shock is a shift in supply. In the case of a disaster, a reduction in supply. Graphically, that would mean that the supply car curve moves to the left towards the smaller quantities on the horizontal Q axis. Using words to explain what a, sh a shift of the supply curve depicts, a decrease in supply means that less is available at all prices. Note that this is different than a change in quantity supplied which would appear on the graph as a movement along the supply curve rather than the shift of the curve that disaster causes. For example, a shift in the supply curve for housing after a huge earthquake tells us that there is less housing available in all price ranges, from studio apartments to fancy mansions. Now, what about demand? If there are a few casualties, demand for housing would be the same before and after the earthquake. Same demand, less supply. You can see where this is going even before we graph it. 
we end up with less housing at a higher price. That doesn't sound good, does it? Well, it shouldn't. Disasters aren't good. But the disaster happened, and the question we're asking is what the market can help us to do to cope with it. Two things happen, and they're both good if our criterion is, as it should be, how well this institution of markets helps us to deal with the increased scarcity imposed by the disaster. The higher price of housing provides an incentive for demanders of housing to demand less. That's good. And since there is less available, how do people demand less housing, you ask? Isn't shelter a basic need? To answer that question, dig back into your economic reasoning toolkit. This is not an all or nothing proposition. It's a marginal problem and people react at the margin. Thus, the higher price of housing encourages an extended family, grandparents, brother and sister and their spouses and kids, to share a single rental house instead of three, while their own houses are being repaired or rebuilt. Quantity demanded at the higher price is one unit of housing instead of three. That's good. The other response that's good is that of the suppliers of housing. The higher prices are an incentive to supply more. And again, especially in the short run, the response is at the margin. People with undamaged basements or unused spare rooms above the garage or travel trailers parked in their driveways rent them out. A businessman waiting to reopen an old apartment building until he can renovate it decides to accept short-term rentals. We can think of lots of ways to increase the quantity of housing available, but we don't have to think of them because the higher price gives an incentive for individuals to use their local and dispersed knowledge to offer more housing for sale. Look at how prices reallocated resources in the gasoline market after Hurricane Katrina incapacitated the Gulf Coast oil industry. Scroll through the outline for lesson, true, uh, for lesson two on the Economics of Disasters website until you find the case study entitled, The Gasoline Market Coped with Supply Shock. While there were some other interesting factors involved that are more appropriate to lesson three on government's role in disasters, the short version of that post-Katrina gasoline market case study is that the supply shock resulted in a price increase which drew in additional gasoline and averted a gasoline crisis. So the first answer to the question of markets can do in the wake of disasters is they send signals in the form of prices that help the economy respond to supply shocks by reallocating resources. And as Hayek famously pointed out, markets perform this function quickly and automatically without the delays entailed in a central authority gathering, analyzing, and acting on the avalanche of new information that a disaster creates. Now, you've probably anticipated where we're going next. Watching media coverage of people lining up for water or trucks delivering chainsaws and plywood to disaster areas, or maybe just your own common sense, has probably led you to realize that disasters can impact the demand side of the market as well as the supply. The demand impact is called a consumption shock. The situation in which people clamor for goods and services that they don't routinely purchase or for much greater amounts of things that they do routinely purchase. Bottled water, ice, plywood, chainsaws, and generators are a few of the items that experience consumption shocks when hurricanes hit major population centers on the coasts of the southern states. So back to our economic terminology, those consumption shocks are demand shifts caused by the lack of availability and therefore higher prices of substitutes, bottled water for tap water, ice for refrigeration, generators for household electricity, or plywood for window glass or doors. On a graph, the consumption shock of this type is illustrated by an upward shift in the demand curve toward the higher quantities as measured on the horizontal Q axis. Now, what story is the graph telling? Well, simply, it's saying that people want more and are willing to pay more to get it, which makes intuitive sense when we think about their changed circumstances. Now, absent long-term warning and time for preparation, which is not generally characteristic of disaster, the supply of things like ice, water, and chainsaws is the same right after the disaster as it was immediately before. 
adding a supply curve to our model allows us to predict the immediate market response to consumption shock. More is purchased at a higher price. Think of this example. A sporting goods store at the edge of town normally carries three or four generators each season. Every month or so, someone wanders in to buy one for his camper in case there are no electrical hookups in the campground. Then the storm hits, and the next day, there are hundreds of people lined up before the owner flips over the open sign. Those people quickly learn that there are only a few generators, and they compete with each other by being willing to pay higher prices. So, what are the next steps in analysis? How does the market work to alleviate scarcity under these conditions? You should be able to tell a plausible story now. Remember that price signals both convey information and provide incentives that change people's choices. First, the higher price encourages people to purchase less. Not less than they would have before the disaster necessarily, but less than they would if the price had not risen. And while individuals may not like this so much, in terms of the larger picture where many people are impacted by the disaster, it's a good thing. It helps people evaluate their own needs more realistically, it encourages them to be creative in considering substitutes, and it discourages over-purchasing just in case. And overall, it leaves more available for others. Notice too that the higher price eliminates a knowledge problem. Remember Hayek and our nobody knows everything activity? The higher price eliminates the need for someone or some agency to make decisions about what and how much people need. Imagine, for example, trying to collect all the information necessary to figure out whether disaster victims want ice to keep medicine from spoiling or because they want to chill their bottled water or whether they want gasoline to evacuate a nursing home or to go sightseeing. Letting the price rise means that we don't have to concern ourselves with whether other people are wasting or getting more than, quote, their fair share, because higher prices reduce the problem of hoarding. While it's understandable that people resort to hoarding in the period of uncertainty that follows disasters, and the fact that they do has been confirmed by many studies, most recently by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, but it's not a desirable response given the heightened scarcity. The market, through higher prices, mitigates the hoarding response, and it does so without force, leaving people free to evaluate various trade-offs in light of their personal assessment of the costs and benefits. To recap then, we've used another economic model, the supply and demand graph, to show two potential impacts of disaster on markets, supply shocks and consumption shocks and then to identify what markets can do to mitigate the increased scarcity that such shocks represent. Thus, the first part of our answer to when disaster strikes, what can markets do, is to simply say, raise prices, because we now understand all that that implies. To lay it out, here's the process. Disasters increase scarcity. Increase scarcity, whether because of supply shocks, demand shocks, or both, raises prices. Higher prices provide incentives for producers to offer more for sale and incentives for consumers to buy less. The impact of increased scarcity, which we need to remind ourselves is nobody's fault, it's just a reality of the disaster, is thus reduced. Now, a caveat here. To assert that markets do indeed address the overall condition of increased scarcity is not the same as saying that higher prices make everyone better off. That's the old fallacy of composition again, confusing our analysis. It's still valid for us to ask, are market-generated prices a good or bad thing for disaster victims? But it's important not to confuse the fact that the disaster itself was not a choice, while our method of responding to the conditions it creates is. So when we ask if markets are a good thing or bad thing for disaster victims, it behooves us to also ask, compared to what? What alternative method of addressing the increased scarcity is being suggested? This is the question that's so often overlooked in our visceral do something reaction to disasters. It's also the question at the heart of one of the biggest issues we have concerning markets and disasters. You guessed it. Cover your ears if they're delicate because I'm going to say the dreaded combination of words that turns normally benign citizens into ranting witch hunters price gouging. Price gouging. There, it's out in the open. 
It's all very well and good to lay out a nice graphic analysis of how higher market prices are a good thing in the aftermath of disaster. But when a disaster actually hits, we can't get over the feeling that it's just not right. And if we happen to be victims, it's like we got a double hit. Oh, fine. First I lose my house, and now I have to empty my bank account just to buy water. If we're spectators, it seems unfair, like hitting someone who's down. And since it's usually kind of hard to find someone to blame for the disaster itself, it's an easy jump to vent our anger on the, quote, greedy businessmen who are making obscene profit off other people's misfortunes. From an emotional, psychological, and we'll get to the political part later, vantage point, it's easy to understand why calls for price controls and anti-price gouging legislation are so common and so widely supported after disaster. However, without in any way disparaging the laudable human desire to help the victims, we need to look realistically at what we want and what we actually do. And our tools of economic reasoning can help us here. Good intentions and compassion are worse than useless if they don't actually help. So let's go back to our graphic model and see what happens when we prevent prices from rising. Okay, hurricane hits, massive property damage. We could use either example, a supply shock or a demand shock or both, and show the same effect. So I've just chosen one, consumption shock. Demand for plywood or chainsaws or ice increases. Market response is to raise the price. Producing what behavior? Well, from producers, they'll bear the higher cost to get more ice or chainsaws or plywood shipped in quickly. From consumers, sharing of chainsaws or ice chests between neighbors, maybe. Not happy about that, true, but not as unhappy as they'd be if there wasn't anything to buy. Now, enter the accusations of price gouging. Possible scenarios include legislation setting maximum prices or price ceilings, as they're called or sensitive merchants who out of goodwill or fear voluntarily resist the market pressure supplied by the sight of their products flying off the shelves to raise prices. We can show the big picture on the graph. At the controlled price, producers are willing to supply a quantity far less than consumers want to buy. In real terms, that means when the neighborhood hardware runs out of chainsaws and he calls his supplier and discovers that the added overnight shipping charge would make the chainsaws cost more than the price he's been selling them, he says, oh, never mind, and he sticks a sold-out sign on the shelf. And those neighbors? Well, when the second one arrived to begin clearing down trees from his house, he asked where the first one got the chainsaw and how much he paid for it. He found out the price was the same as before, so now he's standing in line with lots of other people. He's already upset by the disaster, but he's going to be really mad if he doesn't get to the front of the line before the store runs out. So we're back to the importance of asking about the alternatives to market rationing. If we're not going to let the market ration scarce goods, how are we going to ration them? Because we don't have a magic wand to make the scarcity go away. It helps to understand this problem if we realize that when we adopt anti-price gouging policies, we're really choosing to change from rationing by price to rationing by lines. We shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that time and line is free. We know that it's not in our everyday lives, and there's good reason to argue that it takes on an even higher value in the urgency created by a disaster. Fortunately, we have some empirical models to offer to those who aren't convinced by the logic or by graphic results. Using 2005 data on gas prices and workers' wages, the Institute for Energy Research calculated that an hour in line adds $1 per gallon to the pump price of gasoline for the average worker. So for a car with a 20-gallon gas tank, that's $20 per fill-up. And since the implicit cost of people's time goes up during an emergency, the dollar per gallon probably understates the true cost. The authors of the study concluded that keeping the price of gasoline from rising not only causes the shortages that our graphs predicted, but it also creates other problems as it encouraged people to respond in ways that made more difficulties, including the control price discourages movement of fuel into emergency areas that need it most. The control price encourages hoarding, for example, the practice of tank topping 
increases, and meaning that the average car has much more gas in the tank than it does during normal times. It encourages panic buying and risky behavior, such as storing gasoline in ice chests, in one reported example. And at its worst, it triggers civil unrest. Analysis of consumer behavior after Hurricane Rita revealed that rationing by price control plus standing in line actually encouraged people to allocate gas to less urgent uses, like saving cars instead of people. Since people knew that they would be standing in line for gas anyway, standing in line with two cars instead of one added very little to the cost. Instead of piling the whole family into one car to head out of town, mom and dad drove separately to fill up. If gas prices had been allowed to rise sharply, there would have been a much higher cost to the two-car strategy and much shorter lines at the pumps. News footage of the chaotic evacuation of Houston, closed gas stations, seemingly endless lines at those that were still open, fights between customers, out-of-gas cars clogging the freeways, vividly illustrated the problems created by holding down prices and rationing by time standing in line. Historically, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 offers us a striking contrast. There were no price controls, rapidly rising prices resulted, and there was an efficient reallocation of resources, resulting in an equally rapid return to normal conditions and normal prices. And that's an important point we forget a lot of times. We sometimes don't think about the fact that the same market forces that make prices go up in an emergency make them come back down afterwards. You'll read the case study of housing prices in Chicago as part of the assignment for this lesson. Before closing this lecture, I want to come back to the unhappy disaster victims faced with higher prices and make very clear that saying that the market works isn't intended to diminish our sympathy or denigrate the understandable desire we have to help the victims. What understanding the economic analysis can and should do is to help us to separate the question of what institutions best address disasters from the question of whether we should offer assistance to individual victims of disasters, and if so, how. Those are questions we will address in lessons three and four, and we'll also look more at the alternative of having someone in charge of disaster response. In this lesson, however, we've seen, thanks in part to Hayek's insights on the nature of knowledge, that markets have some clear advantages over centralized responses in their ability to communicate the particular information that is relevant to dealing with the increased scarcity caused by a natural disaster. Additionally, we've used a graphic model of the interactions of supply and demand to predict that the mechanics of markets create incentives for individuals to make choices that alleviate rather than increase scarcity. In the second half of lesson two, we'll use historical and contemporary examples to test the predictions of the model against reality.